Welcome everyone, I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Thanks for checking out Sarder TV, an idea sharing platform founded by Russell Sarder, author, investor, and CEO of Netcom Learning. And joining us today remotely in the studios is Howard Walk, who is co-president of the Cross Country Group. In addition, he's also a successful investor, entrepreneur, and most recently, author. Here to talk about his latest book, Launchpad Republic, America's Entrepreneurial Edge and Why It Matters. Welcome, Howard. So Howard, tell us a little bit about your background and how it led you on this entrepreneurial path and to your current role as co-president of the Cross Country Group. I'm lucky because uh, I'm the son of an entrepreneur and I grew up in the context of a family business. Uh, I had gone to uh, law school. I was a lawyer in New York. I worked in the White House uh, as a lawyer for uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, and I came back and joined uh, this family business that my father had started. And then from there, my brother and I started uh, a half dozen other companies uh, in other industries and in other fields, but using that as sort of the base. And uh, it was really from watching my father as a kid that I kind of got the basics understanding of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial opportunity, and how people make things happen. And then I was able to uh, uh, implement that, deploy that in several other businesses uh, in my early 30s. Um, and uh, it, it worked out really quite well that way. And besides being a successful entrepreneur, investor, you are also an author. So what motivated you to write your new book, Launchpad Republic, America's Entrepreneurial Edge and Why It Matters? And also what makes it unique from other business books? What makes yours stand out? Because I had grown up as the son of an entrepreneur, I, and I was very lucky to have gone to very good uh, schools, at, you know, colleges and universities and law schools. And I always felt for the longest time that people just did not understand how entrepreneurship really worked and really the role of entrepreneurship in society. I take classes on economics and they would talk about supply and demand in the market. I would take classes in law school and it was about jurisprudence and legal history and the political institutions. Uh, and then I took classes uh, actually, or I, and I was a fellow at Harvard in public policy. And there too, I felt people looked at the private sector as monolithic. And the, what wove these things together was this sense that entrepreneurship and the competition between entrepreneurs and big companies is really potent. It's powerful and it's the dynamism that drives the American economy. And I felt that there was not an understanding of the role of entrepreneurship in the broader context of American history and in the broader context of American law and in the broader context of economics and how it works. Now, over the last 20 years, entrepreneurship has gotten much more prominent, but I, I had a, an itch to scratch around articulating exactly why and how entrepreneurship works in this country and why it's so special and what other countries can learn from it. And who is your target audience for this book? I think uh, professionals, CEOs, executives, aspiring entrepreneurs, current entrepreneurs, anybody who is starting to uh, understand uh, entrepreneurship and wanting to see how that role uh, is important in, uh, in, in politics and how entrepreneurship is changing American society and how entrepreneurship will change other societies as, as it continues to go around the world. So it's really for the, you know, I think an economist and a political scientist and a, and a, and a legal professor might learn something quite honestly, but it's really designed for smart, successful professionals uh, and, and, and business people of all stripes who wanna understand how what they're doing plays into the broader political economy. Now, do you think most entrepreneurs possess a rebellious streak and you consider yourself part of that cohort? I think entrepreneurship is highly rebellious. And most entrepreneurs that I've worked with, and I've been an investor in a lot of entrepreneurial enterprises, they all have a little bit of a David and Goliath streak. Some are more uh, overtly rebellious than others, but, but that very much so they take the place in the context of competing against an established company or an established industry and trying to do something, find value, create value, disrupt in a way that hasn't been done before. That's not always the case, but I think a large part of what propels entrepreneurship is this kind of underdog taking on the establishment. And that's not easy to do. And it's not easy for governments to allow it, but we do a really good job of allowing that in the United States. What has been one of your most successful ventures as an investor and entrepreneur? 
and let's talk about how the next generation of startups may have affected your uh, business model and or your growth. Can you share an example? Sure. The main business for us uh, was the business that my father started. Again, I've started probably a dozen others subsequent to that. But that business, he was an entrepreneur. He was he was an insurance uh, agent, and he started a motor club like AAA. And at the time, AAA was there, and actually GE had a motor club. And he decided he was going to try to sell this motor club into car companies and insurance companies and big corporations and do it on a white label basis. Well. He was competing against AAA and he was competing against GE and just kept finding ways to create new value, price differently, be more flexible, customize his offerings. And sure enough, over a 15 or 20 year period, the business grew and is now actually larger than AAA in the sense that our business covers and protects over 120 million motorists, uh, which is quite an accomplishment. And especially since it came out of nothing and compete, competed with the big players. Now. We find ourselves as a powerful incumbent in the industry, the largest player, and we're finding disruptive innovators coming in, nipping at our heels all the time. And quite honestly, as an incumbent, I don't like it. On the other hand, it keeps you on your better. toes, right? Keeps you on your toes. It, it, it keeps you on your toes and it forces us to be smarter. It forces us to do different things. And we bought a company in San Francisco and we we hired quite a bit of new technology talent and we moved aggressively to move to new technology platforms. And we would have done some of that, but we wouldn't have done it nearly to the degree or at the pace or with the level of resources that we're doing now were it not for our competitors. Interestingly, now in a tough economy, some of our competitors are actually facing challenges, but, uh, and, and this is a moment where being an incumbent in some cases can be beneficial. But the dynamism, you know, the dynamism of having and the challenge that we had of small companies nipping at our ankles kept us fresh and it made us better. And I think that's a story that can be re is replicated throughout the economy all the time. Now, in your book, you talk about the two sides of entrepreneurship, uh, encouragement to build and empowerment to destroy. Can you share an example of this mindset from um, our American past and from today? Well, sure. You, you know, throughout American history, there have been upstarts that have come into the market. They've rallied uh, and, and innovated and challenged um, incumbents and then they become big players. And then suddenly when they're there, they take on the mantle of the powerful incumbent. And that has been the sort of the recurring story of, of companies all the time. And even whether you look at the big tech companies today, Google started out do no evil. They were very rebellious and now they're, you know, one of the handful of largest companies in the world. And people view them as powerful incumbents that are actually trying to squelch rebellion. But that goes back historically. I mean, when you look at the late 19th century. In the 1860s and 70s, there were these upstart companies that were taking advantage of the railroads and innovating using mass market and other techniques. And whether it was, you know, the meatpacking companies that would disrupt the local butchers or whether it was the, the sewing machine company Singer that would create uh, a more systemized way to empower people to do sewing. Those were innovators that were driving productivity throughout the economy, but they were disrupting a lot of local players. And we allowed that to happen. Uh, and, but then eventually over time, as they got big, antitrust and other regulatory constructs came in to try to limit that. But it was very much the story of building, 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 but also disrupting at the same time. Uh, and that's not easy. You know, countries around the world are being more and more focused on entrepreneurship. Well, creating new industries and creating new technologies is actually the easy part. The hard part is doing it when it's going to disrupt established companies and, and big established powerful companies with a lot of employees. And that's a trickier thing to do. And, and I, I, I'm curious to see how many of these other countries are going to adjust to that. Uh, but we've done a good job here in the, in the United States. What are the core principles and foundations of American entrepreneurship and what sets us apart from other nations in this regard? Prior to the book, uh, most people would say that it was immigrants. It was a large national marketplace, which I think is still the case. It was the wide open frontier and it was, you know, uh, research universities that, that created new infrastructure and technologies. And I think those are partly the case. But what I think is really unique about the United States is the political system and the way the political system allows entrepreneurship to find light of day. 
That's very, very unique. Israel does a great job of it. Everybody's very well uh, familiar with the story of Israel, but Israel has one advantage, which is they export most of their technology and they disrupt innovate companies in other markets. In the United States, we allow innovators to find their way because we have a separation of powers in different government. You have the legal system, you have the legislation system, you have the executive branch, or because we have federalism where some government happens at a national level and happens, some happens at a state level. But there's always a way for an innovator to find their voice over time. Doesn't always happen, but overall, that has been uh, behind it. We have a second uh, set of areas where our financial system is very decentralized. We've had a lot of small banks. We now have, obviously, a very strong venture capital market. In many other countries, access to capital is very concentrated and very centralized. And, and that's not the case here. Uh, and it hasn't been for a long time. Even the credit markets are often driven by bonds and, and publicly traded fixed income rather than banks. But big banks don't dominate the economy here or the access to capital here the way they do in many other parts of the world, if not most other parts of the world. And then finally, we have a very strong consumer voice. Uh, it's a democracy and consumers want, you know, they want to make their decisions. And it's a stronger voice here than in many other countries. Many other countries, you pay more, uh, you have less choice, you have less recourse. And so here, a good innovator with a good consumer will find its way to the market. The perfect case in point is Uber, faced a lot of challenges, but in the United States, people didn't like the way the taxi cabs were working. Well, local uh, government had to respond and uh, Uber was able to get out to the market and do so bigger and faster than competitors in Europe and Asia and elsewhere. So what role has the U.S. Constitution played in America's entrepreneurial success? Well, the, the Constitution from the very beginning was about power and separation of power and, and uh, competing interests. Most people take the Madison, you know, number 10 or number 53, all the documents about Madison and the Constitution and think about it as political power. But actually, a lot of the Constitution was about economic power and it was about competing interests, and it was about dy dynamism at the economic level, and if, com if the economy was allowed to compete, the politics would follow, uh, and vice versa. And so what I'm trying to argue and, and, and point out is that the Constitution w isn't just a great political document, but it is an amazing economic document. And it is, it is, it's not just about managing power and political power and competing political interests. It's about competing economic interests and having a system of government that allows those competitions to happen every day and ultimately for the best answer to win. How has our past entrepreneurial history affected our current business and political climate? And what lessons do you think we can learn from all of this? You know, I, I look over, look at the last 30 years uh, in America, and I think it's astounding. Uh, you, you, I think people take it for granted. But in the 60s and 50s, 60s and 70s, the economy had been very strong, but it was it was dominated by big corporations and conglomerates and big incumbents. And then that all was challenged. The Japanese and the Germans and competitiveness really, really drove uh, changes under Carter and especially under Reagan. And then all of a sudden we had this wide open entrepreneurial marketplace with much less regulation. I think what's happened, I think the pace of innovation, uh, the pace of, of productivity, the new products and services that have come to market every day has been remarkable over the last uh, three decades. And I think the growth of venture capital has been remarkable over the last three decades. And I sometimes worry that we take it for granted. Uh, and we're starting to take it for granted. And certainly the lack of regulation and the relatively uh, open environment has led to some issues like concentration. And some people argue that the big companies have become too powerful, but I don't see that as fully the case. I see most big companies on their toes as never before to stay ahead of innovation, to look out for disruptors, to get their own house in order, to be able to stay nimble in a way that they were not doing in the 50s and 60s. I said the 50s and 60s were great until the 70s came along. And we've learned those lessons now, I think, very effectively. Now, do you think with our current uh, economy and climate, with inflation, recession, are, the, are these, you think the VCs are going to start pulling back on investing in new companies 
Are you concerned about that? I'm not. Uh, I, I mean, it's happening. There's no question that over the last six months, there has been a, a bit of a chill in the venture capital market. I've seen that in, in numerous examples of that. But the innovation story, uh, the cat's out of the bag on that. And there are new materials, new technologies, new ideas that are still happening that are going to disrupt uh, big companies and that big companies are going to have to be mindful of. And venture capital, there's still $450 billion in venture capital sitting on the sideline, if not more. And so while there, there's more scrutiny and more discipline, which I think is a good thing, and maybe instead of getting 6x, some of these venture funds will get 3x and still be uh, pretty happy about it. So there's a little more discipline in the market, but but I think the innovation story uh, is still going uh, strong and it's also growing strong around the world. Now, another term you discuss a lot in your book is creative destruction. Explain the relevance of this in America and what it all means. It's most well known and attributed to, uh, to Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, an, ec an economist. Some even attribute it to Karl Marx before him. Um, but it's the idea that in a dy dynamic economy, you have winners and losers and you allow new enterprises come in and create new value. And with that, there is a cost, uh, a social cost and other costs. That's the destruction side of it. And the creative destruction is an important part of economic development. And the pace of uh, creative destruction actually matters quite a bit. There's obviously a large social cost to dis destruction lost jobs in particular. There's also some issues maybe about the environment, although environment works both ways, but we, the creation and destruction can sometimes help the environment. But uh, certainly the social costs of jobs and industry dislocation and things of that sort can be significant. There's also real economic value that happens. If you look at uh, the churn rate, and we point out in the book, the churn rate of uh, Fortune 500 companies uh, in the in America, it's getting higher. The lifetime uh, tenure of a of a Fortune 500 company is all time is at the all time shortest, because so much innovation is happening that there's also a degree of destruction of value. But it moves resources to the highest and best use, and many countries, Japan in particular, lament the fact that they don't have enough destruction. They have they they have something like like 30,000 companies over uh, 50 years or over 100 years, some crazy no uh, number of long, long standing companies. And they think that's actually a problem, that something has to allow those companies to die uh, their appropriate death and for new capital and green shoots to come into the market. So it's a good phenomenon in many ways and one that is needs to get continually appreciated uh, and it is appreciated by economists in terms of the importance of creative destruction to keep capital and re resources moving efficiently now at what cost does this creative destruct destruction mindset actually have on we talked about the economy what does it have on the effects of equality and inclusion well i i think that's another promising story because we allow new companies to come into the market and we allow them to get access to capital and we allow them to get access to the market, uh, that creates opportunities for new new entrants to come in uh, that are more diverse, that's more inclusive. And you've seen that quite a bit uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. Now, there are other issues where most of the money is going to people who've gone to these seven or eight universities in these six or seven cities. And so it's not quite as inclusive as it might be in certain metrics, but it is certainly more inclusive in terms of allowing people, uh, women, blacks, di Hispanics, others to get access to the system and to get join companies that have the chance to disrupt established players. And it is a very, there is a lot of renewal uh, associated with entrepreneurship and the heightened degree of entrepreneurship and the higher amounts of capital going to these companies does create a lot of opportunity for increased inclusion, uh, certainly amongst people graduating from the top schools. I, again, I think there is a question about whether or not that's being uh, shared broadly enough uh, geographically and in other areas, but certainly uh, within, within the top schools and in the top t uh, fields, they are more inclusive than ever. Let's talk about unicorns. That's all we ever seem to hear about. What exactly is a unicorn? And can you share an example of a recent one? 
the classic definition are the privately held companies with values of over a billion dollars, and those have continued to grow uh, in the United States. And actually, they're starting to grow elsewhere, India in particular, China as well. Uh, and th those continue to go with more and more venture capital available to invest in companies at these valuations that are uh, really quite high. It's sort of an, a, an amazing thing that you could have a company that's valued at over a billion dollars and not being uh, public, uh, but that, that has happened all the time. It happens quite a bit. It, you know, it, I, I do some work in, in insurance, and there's a lot of insure tech companies that are raising two or $300 million at a four, five, six, seven hundred million dollar valuation, ending up with a billion and a half dollar valuation uh, not too short, at, too far after that. So it happens in all these industries, and then ultimately they're going to get acquired or they're going to have to go public. And what happens now uh, with this, the, the current situation in the stock market uh, might bring some of these valuations a little more down to earth, uh, but they still happen, and uh, they're happening uh, more frequently than they were a long time ago. Maybe not what they, where they were in 2021, but they're still happening. Hey, do you have any numbers about the breakdowns of all these unicorns? Like perhaps what percentage is women and minorities that are uh, founders of these unicorn companies, or is it still mostly that little group? It, 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 there's more work to be done. I, 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 there are some. There, there, there are there are some, but it's probably still less than 10% for sure. Probably less than 5%. Not to say that the management teams of these companies aren't more diverse than ever, because I think they are. Uh, but in terms of women uh, founder uh, uh, unicorns. I have a good friend of mine who was the founder of uh, Policy Genius, woman, very talented, Jennifer Fitzgerald, has done an incredible job. Uh, they're, they're, so she, she's one example of, of, of certainly a woman-founded uh, unicorn, but uh, those, those, are still, uh, not the, those are still the exception rather than the rule. But that, that, that is changing a little bit. Now, do you think government policy or business innovations are better at addressing things like climate and social issues in our country? You know, I, I, I'm not a libertarian by any stretch. There's a role for government. There are important uh, ways that, that uh, government uh, can, can improve our outcomes. But I'm a, still a bit of a skeptic about the government. I, I worked for a while uh, in the uh, in the Clinton administration, and I worked for Vice President Gore's Commission on Reinventing Government. And that was designed to make government work better and cost less. I was young, I was in my late 20s, and I was on this commission, and there were lots of good ideas, but most of them never happened because went into the political process and the committee subchair at some committee that nobody ever heard of but happened to have jurisdiction over some idea never found its way to market. So it made me realize that government just is not that efficient. I think something not a surprise to anybody. And similarly, a lot of government regulation overshoots the mark or misses the mark or is too slow and the market moves more quickly. And so while government is important, I think it's better at setting incentives, creating infrastructure, focusing on education and creating a stable market and not as effective at trying to pick winners or really regulate very closely for economic outcomes because I think the market moves much more quickly. Look at electric vehicles. We had fuel standards for over 25 years and they inched along, inched along, inched along. It's fine. It wasn't until Elon Musk and Tesla and the private uh, market came along and forced disruption that suddenly all of a sudden Ford and GM are very focused on electric vehicles and doing a great job wasn't because of the government, it was because of a catalyst from the private sector, from an entrepreneur that was well-funded, that was using new technologies and that was disrupting the players that actually uh, has done more for electric vehicles than 25 years of government uh, efforts to try to uh, ameliorate uh, or to try to change fuel economy. Can you share an example of upstarts who tore down the old way of doing business, obviously leaving a trail of, lot of lots of job losses, et cetera, but then in the, were able to create more successful and efficient business models? Anything come well, to mind recently? Well, well cert again, certainly I think Tesla, Tesla is an amazing story around that, where, where they have uh, made electric vehicles work, and, and it's just, just re remarkable to me. Um, but it's, it's happened that way throughout history. Cornelius Vanderbilt is, was an amazing story. He just kept reducing costs, reducing costs, reducing costs, vertically integrating, kept pushing the limits, reduced the cost of transportation by 80%. 
remarkable. And people didn't like it, but he kept going. Even some of the the folks like uh, Carnegie and Rockefeller, they just kept driving costs down, driving costs down, using creating new technologies and platforms that enable em- enormous amounts of economic growth. But they disrupted a lot of uh, older industries while they were at it. And um, so it, it happens you know, all, the, all the time. And uh, it's a great part of what, what I think makes this country uh, moving forward. Talk a bit about Silicon Valley, uh, how they completely upended and revolutionized entrepreneurial the landscape here. And do you think uh, they need to be reined in with stricter regulations and accountability, especially with, I guess, regards to privacy and everything else that we keep hearing about? Yeah, I mean, look, there's no question that there's a lot of pressure uh, around regulating and reining in big tech. I completely understand it. It's part of a long-standing American tradition. You know, some people want to reign in government. Some people want to reign in big business. Depends on where you are on the political spectrum. But the idea of trying to reign in big tech makes sense in, in that respect. But I, I think it's over overdone. I think we are so lucky to have this competition amongst the top handful of big tech companies. I think there are platforms that allow innovation to come to market in, downstream in ways that w- were unimaginable before. If you're a musician, you can get access to the market better than ever. If you have a small idea, a small app, a small service provider, you can get access, whether it's Etsy, eBay, Angie, there's so many different technology platforms that are allowing you to get to the market d- directly. Now, I understand that these platforms are getting their pound of flesh, and that has to be watched. My biggest issue on big tech is that a lot of times consumers don't know how to make change and that the choices that they have are oftentimes hard for them to understand. So so I don't think I would regulate big tech for, on an economic basis, but I think work around disclosure and making it easier for consumers to manage their privacy and understand exactly what's going on and to speed up their switching makes a lot of sense. One of the big things that we talk about Uh, we talk about briefly in the book, is 800 number portability, which happened in the 90s, where suddenly you could own your 800 number. Well, that allowed you to move your cell phone very quickly and create an enormous value, put the consumer in charge, and put the telcos sort of a little bit behind. And I think more of that is is what's going to be needed uh, in the big tech field. Now, do you think all of these um, antitrust suits could lead to harmful stifling effects to the entrepreneurial landscape? I'm not a big fan of, of of antitrust. Certainly, when there's collusion and there are there's bad behavior, uh, there's a role for antitrust. And I think having them look over the shoulder of companies is probably a good thing. But I, I don't believe that that, entre- that uh, antitrust is the, the best solution to many problems. I, I do believe that ultimately, with abundant venture capital and good ideas, I think entrepreneurship is going to be the best way to hold big companies accountable. You know, one one example we talk about in the book is A and P. A and P was the biggest, one of the biggest companies in the world. They were dominating the grocery market. They were disrupting all these local grocers. There were a lot of antitrust efforts, and some of them half succeeded. But it wasn't until the development of the supermarket and changing in consumer behavior and new new firms coming into the market that ultimately A and P went by the by. They're out of business now. They had an incredible hundred year plus run. But it wasn't antitrust. Antitrust might have beat them up a little bit, but it was really the innovation and new technologies and new demographics and other things that actually uh, brought them to task much better than any antitrust could have. Now, why do you think entrepreneurship is still considered one of the most potent forces on a global scale? Well, the, so many countries around the world are starting to see what can ha- what, what's what's available and what they can do, and and I think that's really exciting. Uh, I think it's going to lead to enormous uh, improvements uh, in people's lives around the world. It's going to create a lot of economic value in parts of the world that that need it. Uh, it's going to create a lot of innovation for consumers and for businesses, and people are understanding how this can really be a very potent force. So that's very exciting. What I think is really exciting is how the development of entrepreneurship around the world might lead to some political change, political reform, new powers coming into markets. And and it's very hard to put entrepreneurship back in the bottle, so to speak. And as new uh, people get into the economic system through entrepreneurship, I think there's likely chances that the political world might change as well and hopefully lead to better governance and more inclusivity and more political participation across the world.
Now, how can we continue to leverage um, this rebellious entrepreneurial spirit that sets America apart? And what country do you think is basically our competitor at, at our heels? Obviously, China is, has been uh, topic number one uh, over the last several years. Although now it's interesting that you're starting to see some slowing in growth uh, and some other challenges and some demographic issues as well. But I've done some work in China. I was involved in founding uh, what's the largest rental car company in China. And it was grow, 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 uh, and it did quite well. But uh, it was very politically tied and very politically connected. And so what often happens is you, you can become the incumbent, but I don't know how much success anybody's going to have challenging that company over time because it's so politically connected and in, under an authoritarian capitalism model, it doesn't seem like there's going to be a lot of room for new entrants over time. And so I think the lack of creative destruction in China will be an issue for the country over time. And obviously, uh, when you look at what happened with uh, Xi and reining in the big tech entrepreneurs about uh, two years ago, uh, Jack Ma and what happened, you sort of see, wow, that there's some risk that entrepreneurship might be a threat to the political order. So I, I think I think China, certainly it's a big power. It's going to continue to be entrepreneurial, but I think it's going to have its work cut out for it. The other country that's doing incredibly well is India, which is now surpassing China in population and surpassing China in the number of unicorns. That's got a lot of other issues politically and, and, and structurally, but that's certainly a country that's got a long way to go uh, uh, in terms of opportunity ahead. Any predictions for the next Silicon Valley type of innovations? And are you currently working on any potential unicorns you can share with us? You know, Steve Case obviously has been spending a lot of time talking about the rest, uh, the rise of the rest and these other uh, these other uh, country uh, parts of the country. You know, look at what happens in, in Pittsburgh with robotics and Carnegie Mellon. There's lots of stories around it, it, the automotive industry in South Carolina. North Carolina is doing some inter, some interesting innovation. Alabama. There are a lot of places where I think new technologies, materials, energy sources, things of that sort will drive quite a bit of growth, and largely based on universities, but also around uh, very strong educated workforces and other kinds of capabilities. So I think there's a lot of opportunity within the United States, and I think there's certainly going to be opportunity abroad, and we're going to see hopefully many, many decades of continued entrepreneurial activity. And I'd be curious to see how countries grapple with with it as these entrepreneurial companies become successful. I, I'm working on two comp two things now that I I hope that they're unicorns. I don't know. I can't guarantee it. But one is uh, motorcycle insurance using a smartphone uh, to provide almost like an OnStar in your pocket for motorcycle riders uh, and insurance, it's called Boundless. I'm very excited about that. We just raised some venture capital from a very uh, reputable insurance tech uh, venture firm. Uh, and then I'm working on a prop tech real estate technology company called NewZip, which is working on uh, linking mortgage companies and real estate brokers uh, and helping consumers uh, get a better choice of real estate brokers and save some money while they're at it. So I think it's fun. I have two, I have three bigger companies, and but it keeps me fresh. Whether they, I hope they work. I think they will. But I, I love the energy. I love the talent. We're bringing in great people. And uh, you feel like you're doing something that's going to matter uh, for people. And, and hopefully it will work. Not easy to do, but a lot of fun. Well, Howard, it was great and interesting talking to you today. And best of luck with your new book. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Nice to be here. And that's it for this edition of Sarder TV. We hope you enjoyed and learned something new today. Until next time, I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Thanks for watching.